Now, one of the things that makes archaeology interesting is that when archaeologists find some form of stone tool, sometimes it's a best guess on really what it is. One stone tool that I've come across recently in a lot of the research and reading and just exploration that I do in his stone tools, and that's called the Tenerin disc. Now the Tenerin disc comes from the Tenerin region of the Sahara Desert in Niger. Now it's made from a volcanic ash called felsite, and it's been silicified, meaning that it was once ash and through time and processes, it eventually hardened out and became stone. Now the Tenerin people of this region at that time uh, 4,500 to 8,200 years before present, using this stone tool in kind of an unknown way. There's some best guesses, like I said. The exact idea on how it was used and what it was used for is somewhat unknown. Now, we do know it's a stone tool, um, and it is shaped to be a bifacial form with flaked edges all the way around, something similar to a circular knife or something like an axe head that could have been easily wedged in some form of a handle. It could have been some sort of ornamental piece, but the circular form is very odd. As we look at a lot of different stone tools throughout the ages, and keep in mind that the, the Tenorin period is a little bit more current, um, most of them are spearheads, projectile points, scrapers, burns, awls, things to that extent. But this circular form is kind of an oddity. What is its purpose? How is it made? I'll definitely be able to answer one of those today because I'm going to make a Tenorin disc. And during one of my future butchering classes, I'm actually going to put it to work. I personally believe it was more into the lines of butchering, kind of like uh, some of the ovate hand blades I've used in the past. But I think this form just had a more of a circular sort of shape to it. So let's make a Tenorin disc and uh, maybe solve this mystery. regular stuff, a piece of Georgetown maybe. Now these guys weren't that big. They weren't, you know, something this size right here. Let's see. Uh, I think that might work. Out of the numbers that they found, most of them have been about three inches in total diameter. Some that are bigger, some that are smaller, but I can imagine if you start with a bigger one, eventually it's gonna work its way down into a smaller one. I do have a lot of stone. I think this guy looks and feels right. As I'm looking at it, I can kind of see the disc on the inside. I'll make it a little bit bigger, uh, just so when I do put it into action, butchering a bison, I can kind of get some of that uh, feel more importantly. When you start with a bigger stone tool, and as it's been used, whether it's cutting fireboards, cutting plant fibers, or scraping hides, or cutting meat, it's going to dull out and you're going to resharpen it. So I always like to start on the larger side and then sharpen it as needed. And as you know here, stone and bone only. <laughs> so really the goal is just going to be to biface this out remove most of this mass, and then just make it into a circular shape. I'm gonna try and come back this way. Good flakes. One of the things I kind of noticed when doing some research, backs of these Tenorin discs, 
there was a lot of steps and a lot of hinges. And that could have been from as this piece of stone gets more circular and that edge becomes more rounded, it might have been harder to throw flakes across without doing an overshot because these were relatively small because you're dealing in 360 degrees of stone with pretty much a kind of a continuous platform. So they might have pulled off on their strikes a little bit, which caused some hinges. But the reality is, do I think they personally cared about the aesthetics of it? No, absolutely not. It was more of a functioning tool. It's going back to that kind of philosophy. There's a time for art and there's a time for tools. And if you're always thinking about how to make something so beautiful, you might be losing the time where you actually need that tool. Maybe let's get maybe this chunk off here. Focus on that. It's, it's weird making circles. Circles are always kind of fun to make because you try to get them as circular as possible, but sometimes they come out a little wonky. That's a good piece. We'll save him. So we're going to raise this edge up and try to attack a lot of this thickness here. Probably be the best. So I'm just chipping away like this. I'm really, you got to think not every strike is designed to remove a mass amount of flakes. Sometimes these little guys, sometimes my little pops are designed really to raise an edge or to present a better platform when I'm napping. You gotta be kind of methodical about it because you are removing stone. But I know just looking at it, this edge over here rides different than this edge over here. So if I can remove the flakes from this top side across, it's gonna help raise this side up and allow me to address the flakes across. There's, there's an action to it. As you remove flakes, it's also preparing other platforms. It's also preparing other striking opportunities, uh, whether they're just conditioning flakes or something in a large removal to actually address flakes across the stone. Just took all those little small flakes. Those are all the flake scars right through here. But what I've done is I've raised my edge up so I can attack this mass over here with some different billets. Good chunk. Good chunk. Is a little bit different. See, it's easier when you're working in something that is elongated because you can throw flakes across and you can follow those ridges the whole way up and down. On something that eventually becomes circular, you're shooting flakes in kind of like the center of a clock. So you can get some high points in a lot of those tenoran discs. We see those kind of high points that are all hinged kind of right in the middle. We're gonna to try to avoid that, but see how it plays out.
coming along. I think I just need to get it, I still feel like it's kind of flatter on these sides. I might address more of the circular shape uh, once I get to the pressure flaking, but it's thinning out, that's for sure. So it's pretty circular. I think I'll address the last kind of shape and profile of it to more circular with some pressure flaking. feel like you're starting to make something that's longer on the sides. So here, if these are longer on the sides, what I need to do is go to my perceived tips and bring those in and that will kind of round it out when making circles. So this is my perceived like tip, these two ends right here. So I'm going to kind of bring them in, bring them in and that will give me more of a rounded edge. She rolls a little bit right. test. Oh, 
almost there. A bit here. And that is one Tenorin disc. And I think the coolest part about this while napping it, as I've kind of shown earlier in some of those digital images, you can see where by throwing flakes around a 360 degree sort of bifacial form, you can get some hinges, you can get some steps, and you can kind of get a little bit of a mass buildup. I was able to avoid it, but right here, you could, but right there, you could almost start to see that process building up as I was throwing flakes. All of those terminations are terminating right in the middle. You don't want to go so far that you do an overshot flake and it comes to the other edge and you rip that chunk out. But all those terminations are kind of right in the middle. And it's, it's, it's interesting, especially having done this with original tools, no copper, how you can get that same sort of effect. You can almost replicate exactly the same process that the Tenorin people did to create these discs and also get that little bit of a high spot. Not so much here, one little, little hinge here from a flake that came across, but it's pretty cool to be able to replicate it and almost get those same kind of effects right in the middle. I mean, are they necessarily a bad thing? That gives you a little something else to hold on to. The question now is, is it more of a hand blade that was used for butchering, cutting fibers of you know grasses and meat? Or was this hafted into some sort of kind of circular kind of ax like this? I mean, I could see it being used kind of as that multi-tool, a circular cutting tool, throwing in a quick ax handle to process some wood or chop through something with uh, some thickness, but it's an interesting little tool especially because of its circular shape not that it's super hard to make circles but if your objective is to really create a perfect circle it's going to take some time it's going to kind of take a level of kind of understanding of the stone as well as how to uh, you know nap it properly the true uses who knows was it an axe head was it a knife was it some sort of uh ornate piece because it's a circle we'll never know but my belief i think it was used very very likely in butchering feels like it would be a great butchering tool i think it would definitely get the job done all right there you go one tenor and disc thanks for watching